Hey there. Hey, how are you? Good. How's it going? We should introduce ourselves. I'm Rich Lowry with National Review. Uh, I'm Noam Shiver at the New Republic. So, how's it going down there? Are you in Washington? Uh, I am in Washington. I'm a little checked out. I'm actually on book leave. So, um, oh. I'm, I'm working in the office, but I'm not really seeing anybody in the office or talking to anybody in the office. Uh, Are you allowed to say what your book is? Yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a narrative of the Obama administration economic team, you know, starting with the transition oh, great. and working through their responses to the various Wonderful. crises. <clears throat> I, I thought that might be the first Bob Woodward book, but he went with the war. I was very instead. relieved. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. Very relieved, yes. I, I was I was really rooting for him to just kind of continue in the in the foreign policy trajectory. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that was... Well, because the, the one he... The first Clinton one he did, maybe it was everything that he did, but it was it was at least overwhelmingly... Oh, no, economic. yeah. I don't uh, remember it. That was my nightmare, yeah, that we'd have the agenda part two, and we did not. So, or at least not, not yet. Um, anyway, well, well it's good, we, good um, for you too, because I, I think the domestic stuff is more interesting. Although we're in the midst of a, yes. a foreign policy time at the moment. That's right. Well, why don't you? Uh, why don't Why don't we jump in? What's your What's your sense of uh, <clears throat> how it's been going in Libya? What Obama's been doing, and where we're headed? Well, it's been very nerve wracking. As a reluctant supporter of this intervention, it's. Um, been maddening at times. I don't know whether that's just uh, a lack of realism on my part in terms of the juggling you have to do to keep a coalition together and uh, just the inherent military difficulties on the ground. Apparently this uh, latest episode where the rebels were pushed almost all the way back to where they had started when we began this intervention, part of the reason for that was just bad weather over three days, so maybe I should just be more cognizant of practical right. considerations like that. But it's just, I assume Gaddafi's uh, going to go and that we won't stop until he, he does go, but it is an assumption and we may have a, um, a mismatch between the means and ends there. <clears throat> and I, I certainly think we're going to have a mismatch between means and ends when it, become, when it comes to the ultimate humanitarian rationale of this intervention, because we learned in Iraq, um, you can you can have a, a dictator sitting on a society in the most brutal way possible, and then, and then when you uh, get him to go, it's like picking up a rock in the middle of the stream where the you know, the rock looks looks pretty ugly, you know, from the top, and then you look what under what's underneath it, and it's even worse, right. <clears throat> and you can just sort of let let the lid <clears throat> off on uh, all sorts of terrible forces, and I fear that's what we uh, may see. In Libya, and we will be even much um, less prepared to deal with it than we were in Iraq, because you need troops, you know, lots of troops on the ground. We had them in Iraq, but not in sufficient numbers, and and they weren't doing the right things until 2007. You need to have an intimate knowledge of the social and political realities on the ground. We thought we had some of that going into Iraq. We really had almost none, and it took us years and years of. Um, uh, blood, sweat, and tears on the ground to gain that knowledge, and um, <clears throat> you need a plan, and we didn't have much of a plan going into Iraq, or at least we planned for the wrong things. We have no plan going into Libya. So this war, to me, looks as though it, it, if it succeeds in the goal of, of uh, ousting Gaddafi, it will end up being a 20, 21st century style punitive expedition, in effect, against the Gaddafi family, wrapped in a lot of humanitarian rhetoric with a lot of uh, liberal support with the blessing of the UN, um, but the, the things that you would do to actually improve the society and make it better governed afterwards, we seem to have very little interest in and very little preparation for. Now, I'm okay with that because my, my basic, the reason I basically support the war is just to get rid of uh, Gaddafi because I, I think he's a, a menace and has American blood up to his elbows, but I'm a little mystified. Um, why uh, liberals, um, so many kind of liberal hawks are back to supporting um, something like that, including some of your colleagues at the New Republic. Yeah, so I, uh, a lot of interesting thoughts there. Um, one sort of macro thing, but in a small thing before I get into that. Um, uh, I um, found it very interesting that the president, you know, in trying to define the difference between Libya and Iraq, um, talked about how 
the difference here is we're not going to actively topple Gaddafi the way we did Saddam in Iraq. And the reason is because if we did that, then we would own it. You know? And I kind of think we own it anyway. You know, um, so I was, um, uh, and, and all the thing, you know, all of the, the the consequences that follow from that that you described. So um, I do think um, maybe liberals and people on the left um, have this. Um, I won't call it a delusion, but ha are, are sort of reassured in ways that they shouldn't be um, because they imagine there to be differences uh, procedurally uh, uh, with Iraq that, that maybe um, exist but don't, uh, don't matter. <laughs> um, so, so that is interesting to me. Um, on the macro point, I, I, um, I guess I would back up. I, I don't know that I believe that um, we're in this until he's gone, and that's my biggest concern, I think, um, I mean, for the obvious reasons that, um, you know, if he stays and we go, then we've only deferred the scenario we were trying to avert, which is the massacre of lots of people in the East in particular, but just generally. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, we have a guy with a, with a long history of, of, uh, of you know, uh, terrorist acts. Uh, who's really pissed off at us. Uh, so that's not good. And, and just generally uh, an ability to sort of stir trouble in the region. So uh, I think it probably, you know, it should be the policy to get rid of them. I, I'm just not convinced that we're going to do that, um, partly for the because of the distinction that the administration is trying to draw with Iraq, partly because... Um, you know, because of the, you know, in order to really ensure that it happens, you probably do need a, a stronger commitment of whatever it is, troops or arming rebels or, or training rebels. Um, and I just don't know that public opinion um, is there. I don't know that we're going to have um, an appetite among, uh, you know, domestically to, um, to do what it takes, particularly with Iraq and Afghanistan still going. So I kind of, when I think about whether this is a good idea and whether I support it, I kind of, I would love to see him go, um, but I, I, I evaluate it from the assumption that he won't necessarily go. And then I sort of try to think, well, is it a good idea even then? And I'm, it's a very close call to me. I mean, I do think it was sort of noble and, you know, heroic to try to avert this massacre in Benghazi, which was clearly going to happen. Um, but if he doesn't end up going, um, I think you have to weigh two considerations. One is... Um, what we end up doing is just deferring sort of a massacre and a lot of bad stuff, um, which is bad uh, because not only have we not stopped it, but we've taken a hit to our credibility because we sort of said we were going to stop it and then we didn't. Uh, and we've indicated, you know, say to the Taliban in Afghanistan that you can just sort of wait us out. Uh, and We don't really mean to finish jobs that we start. So that's bad. Um, but the plus side, I guess, is... Um, had we not gone in, we would have said to everyone in the region, uh, if you're like Mubarak and you go peacefully, um, you know, you lose your regime, but if you react with kind of murderous force, then you get to stay and it's fine. And so we've, um, even if he doesn't end up going, we've like dramatically increased the cost of that. Um, you know, he's, he's lost a lot yeah. of valuable assets, and um, it's generally probably not been a good couple of weeks for him, uh, a lot of defections. It's, it's, it's costly. You know, even if he doesn't end up going, we've really increased the cost. And that has, I think, some strategic implications for how the, the Arab Spring plays out. So, um, so I kind of come at it sort of assuming that he might not go and trying to evaluate, it, evaluate whether it was nonetheless a good idea. And it's, it's, it's just a really close call for me. Those two things are, like, are very close. Um, so I kind of agonize and go back and forth. Yeah, no, it, is, it is a very close choice and an agonizing one. If he doesn't go, you know, I think it will be clearly worse for our prestige yes. than having just warned him and having him ignore us, which right. I thought would have been um, bad for our right. prestige. But this will be worse. But it will probably be worse for Gaddafi because he'll, he'll lose... Uh, I would assume part of his country, and right. I, I think um, unless we suffer a catastrophic collapse here, which I don't totally rule out, but um, I, I think we would at least save the the eastern part of the country for his from his clutches, and then you'd be engaged in a longer game to to try to um, topple him over the, the the longer term. But I just wonder, you know, how sustainable is a yeah. is a partition? Is it much harder? Than it, than it looks because it's just hard to draw a line in the sand and defend um, those cities in the east. Can he just send, you know, disguise to civilians as right. terrorists or as snipers? So, so um, it, but my bottom line is, um, again, I, I, I think you'll 
he'll go because I'm still a kind of believer in the Milosevic scenario that this is will be a version of Kosovo, a war with you know entirely from the air, with no congressional authorization, yeah. tenuous public support, a president whose commitment is is questionable yeah. um, at times. But at the end of the day, you're dealing with with a very uh, primitive military that you can just degrade and degrade and degrade until um, it just can't take it anymore. But after that, I'm just not optimistic. I, I really have a hard time seeing how we're going to avoid um, elements of, of his regime and his supporters becoming an insurgency. So, right. And so and it's very hard to see who you're going to hand over to. This transitional na national council sounds great, right. but is very a very ramshackle uh, operation. So it seems as though you can have a vacuum of, uh, of authority um, and um, a police presence to kind of prevent or keep down an insurgency. So I, I think and the best case scenario for me is Gaddafi is gone, yeah. but even then I think it's going to be a heck of a mess. Right. No, I agree. A mess seems like the most likely scenario. Um, just to back up a step, though, I mean, how confident are you that, um, you know, we can even maintain a, a no-fly zone in the east indefinitely? I mean, when we did this stuff in Iraq, um, you know, in the 90s, that was obviously before the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, what, you know, I mean, it's sort of low cost in relative terms, but, you know, on top of a lot of other stuff, a lot of other commitments, and with a public appetite pretty low at this point, um, you know, it's, it's not it's not nothing, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. particularly if you have the occasional mechanical failure or whatever, a plane just falls out of the sky and, you know, and you, you're, you get to highlight the, the ten, you know, the hundreds of millions of dollars that that particular plane costs. And, um, you know, these never make for good headlines and you just have that stuff over periods of months, you know, when you do um, these kind yeah. of engagements. Um, well, you know, I, <coughs> go ahead. I would assume we'll just hand it over to the British and French, which we're already yes, doing. Right. Um, I mean, we're even handing over the, the air campaign to yep. them now, so it'd be a question of, of how much um, willpower they have right. which is to sustain it, which is, which is questionable, yeah. although they were more gung-ho about this thing than, than we, we were, which doesn't mean that they can't turn around and, and dump it uh, themselves. Um, well, I think we, we have consensus here that uh, it's ugly uh, going forward. Um, what, so what's your sense of, um, you know, before we move on, maybe just a quick um, uh, dive into what's going through Obama's head. I mean, what, what's your sense of his instincts, um, some kind of, you know, he obviously sort of, uh, he may, I can't remember if he explicitly disavowed the existence of a doctrine or all but explicitly disavowed the existence of a doctrine, but it reminded me of sort of the, the Bush v. Gore Supreme Court decision where, you know, they, they basically said, don't, you know, don't look at this as a president of any kind, you know, this is a one-off right. thing. <laughs> yeah. um, what, what's your, you know, um, what's your, has he evolved at all? Are we seeing the kind of true Obama on this stuff? Um, what is the true Obama on these kinds of engagements? Do you have, I mean, what, what's your sense? I, I have some ideas uh, of my own, but... Uh, I, I tend to think that um, he's right when he says there there isn't a doctor, and I, I think the circumstances and the reasoning here are are so carefully tailored for exactly this circumstance that you really can't apply it right. <laughs> anywhere else. You know, how, how often are you going to have an, an intervention um, where you can act relatively quickly, which only took one French airstrike to initially yeah. save Benghazi, and where you're going to have the whole world um, more or less braying yeah. for you to do this, you know, people in the region, the Arab League, the Gulf Council, and the Europeans out in, uh, ahead of you wanting to do it, where there's very little military risk. We had a plane go right. down, there may, may be other incidents, but in the scheme of things, you know, it's, it's not anything like Iraq and Afghanistan, and where there's someone you can immediately uh, hand things off to. It just it seems to me, it, I, I'm not sure any of that applied to any of the interventions that we didn't do, right. um, you know, that everyone is um, so so ashamed of. You right. know, under this doctrine, you right. still wouldn't do Rwanda, I, I assume, or Sudan. Right. So, yeah, so I, I don't think it's the, there's a doctrine. And the extent there is one, it seems to me more ruling out interventions than ruling yeah. them in. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I mean, the, what struck me, and it may be a similar way of, or a slightly different way of getting the same place, is just the, the overwhelming emphasis on procedure and proceduralism, um, which I think is very Obama. You know, he's a guy who has yeah. enormous faith in process and comes close. So I don't, you know, at times maybe even says that the kind of pro you get the process right, the outcome is right. You know, the procedural 
kind of justice is justice. Um, and, uh, and I do think that is a kind of, um, uh, you know, I mean, in this case, it, 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 it worked out, but I, I do think you're right, that it's very difficult to imagine a lot of other places where the process would kind of come together like this, in, in which case the question is like, well, what happens when the mission is right but the process is wrong? You know, and I yeah. think we still don't know where he comes out on that. You know, um, it seemed like enough of a of a kind of struggle. Um, you know, justifiably. I mean, I, as I said, I mean, I'm I agonize over this stuff too, so I don't I don't mean to trivialize the the calculus here. But um, but I think we still don't know what you know. In this case, we you just had a nice uh, convergence of of process and procedural considerations and sort of. Uh, absolute considerations, and I just, you know, yeah. in the future, it's very easy, as you say, to imagine them diverging. I don't know how he's. Uh, how he's gonna play well, a, a big thing in my mind as well is just how sincere he is about the process, because when he says uh, the goal of our military operation is not to topple right. Gaddafi, and everyone else says that, um, I assume. Right. That's total nonsense. Right. You know, of course, it's in furtherance of that right. goal, right. And, I, and I hope it is. Right. But they, uh, but I, I think it's it's still unclear whether that's um, true or, or or not. Whether this is kind of diplomatic dodginess and further of his in furtherance of his ultimate goal, or whether he's sincere in putting the, the right. UN um, mandate and right. uh, the demands of the coalition ahead of what right. what is his ultimate goal. Right, no, I think that's right. We may see here, you know, in this case, actually, when all the stars align, they don't actually align that way, and we, we do see this diversion. So, um, yeah, no, I think that's right. I think it's, um, uh, you, know, I, you know, look, at some point, he's just going to have to make a choice, what, you know, whether the process is more important than the goal, or vice versa. Um, and, I, and I think we just don't know where he comes out of that, you know, which is... Uh, which just is just one, one last point on Libya that, that ir irritates me a little bit. I, you know, I think the stakes in Libya are much smaller than Iraq, our risks are much smaller than Iraq. We can screw it up in all sorts of ways, and it's not going to um, matter or hurt the, the way Iraq did. But um, <clears throat> and we're not going to pay the kind of cost we did in, in Iraq. But to me, the the um, the idea that this was, which we heard initially when Obama went in about how careful he was and how he waited to line things up, I just think it's total nonsense. He just acted right at the end right. when there is uh, when he's just faced with the stark choice: let Benghazi go and right. let Gaddafi roll roll over these people or not. And he right. he picked not. I think that was the right choice. Right. That was the the choice I made. I was very reluctant about this right. the whole time, um, but it was just too much to watch that happen. Right. And then it was kind of um, trying to get the pieces in place in a mad scramble after that. So for me, all, all the weight it was not a process of careful deliberation. It was a process of indecision, and at the end, just not having any any choice. I, I think there's a lot to that, though. I do think that they, my understanding is that they kind of proceeded on a bit of a parallel track. They had Susan Rice sort of start laying the groundwork. Um, on a kind of parallel track in the you know in the weeks before, and I think it was just kind of see what you can get at the UN. Um, so in the event that we need to go this route, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, so so I, I, I you know I kind of quibble that it was completely uh, completely on the fly. But you know in terms of um, in terms of gaming it out sort of strategically, I mean again that would, that's sort of more of a procedural thing. I think you're. I think you're um, anyway, well, maybe we should we should move on to, to the domestic side of things too. Um, yeah, we got a, we got a shutdown to cover here. That's right. Yeah, um, a looming shutdown. Um, so, what's your what's your sense? I mean, the, I guess the big question, right, is um, is I mean, maybe I think it's a big question because I'm on the other side of the spectrum, and you you, you have a big question for Mo, for Obama. But I see the big question as, as Boehner. You know, um, uh, he's got this huge. Um, you know, force uh, on his right, you know, a huge amount of pressure where uh, a lot of Tea Partiers and freshmen in the House um, just want him to show some, you know, some backbone and, and at least fight for the full $61 billion in cuts. Um, and then, you know, he's got this, you know, probably very uh, legitimate anxiety that, um, you know, the White House obviously can't go for that. They can't go for that in the riders. And so the result of, of just being a complete hardliner will be a shutdown, and the shutdown, the CW is, though you may disagree with it, um, is, uh, is bad for Republicans. Um, uh, so, you know, it's kind of the, the pick your poisons. And, and, you know, and if he makes a deal, um, you know, he has to worry, uh, worry about uh, defections and 
maybe an overthrow at some point. So, I mean, I guess it, it seems like a kind of a pick your poison moment for Boehner. I mean, maybe you disagree. Maybe you think the onus is kind of on the White House and it's a pick your poison moment for them. Um, but I sort of feel like they've gone as far as they can in making compromises, more or less. I mean, a couple billion here or there, they could probably do. But there's certain, some of these riders they can't really do, and they can't go all the way up to 61 billion or, or really that close to it. So it seems like the White House is kind of maxed out on its, it, what it's prepared to do and what it can do. Um, but Boehner kind of has to make a decision at this point. Yeah, he's in a tough spot. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if there's a a shutdown. I haven't worked the hill much over the last two days, but that's just the way it seems. Because the although I think the, the Democrats have notionally uh, come pretty far the Republicans' yeah. way. I mean, that top line number of 33 is bigger than the original Ryan number of yeah. 28. And for me, I'd, I'd be curious what you, you think about this. The amazing dog that hasn't barked, to use the cliche, in this debate is, uh, you know, I thought the 28 from Ryan's pretty ambitious in the scheme of things yeah. as far as cutting things goes because it's so hard yeah. and then when they they doubled it I, I just thought okay I, I admire that uh, sentiment and I, I hope this works but it's going to give them the other side so many targets yeah. and uh, it, it just that counterattack uh, hasn't really been mounted or if it, it has no one's really noticed and I, I don't know whether it's that uh, there's distractions with so much else going on you know Wisconsin and whatnot or whether in this fiscal environment maybe those sort of attacks they just don't have the same kind of purchase they used to but anyway that's a broad point I, I would think they're still far away though because you, you got the 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 distance between the two numbers, 33 and 61. Then you have, how are you going to get those numbers right? Because re Republicans uh, are, are really want to have actual cuts and actual programs and right. feel as though the Democrats are getting there uh, to their number through smoke, smoke and mirrors. Right. Then you have the the riders, which there is an right. agreement on. So, so those are still three pretty big disagreements. And um, there is, I, I think, among Democrats, you see this most obviously with Chuck Schumer or with Howard Dean, who just says it out loud. Right. There's a calculation that shutdowns can be good for them, which I think is a fairly reasonable calculation, unless they're too blatant about it. And uh, there are freshmen who, who just um, think you know they're there to change things, and um, uh, you can't you know uh, 61 billion. If you're going to cut 61 billion in an environment with a, a deficit this high, it's still just a drop in the bucket, so you might as well go all the way and, and get that. And there's no reason to compromise on something that's a drop in the bucket in the scheme of things. So I think you have both both sides there um, uh, for different reasons um, heading towards a, a shutdown. Yeah, I agree. It seems really, um, I mean, even again, unless, you know, I guess the counter argument is that Boehner real decides, look, um, no matter what I do, there's going to be an insurgency on my right. <laughs> you know, there's, uh, it's just that we're not, we're clearly not getting 61 billion, and um, you know, we're not getting 61 billion in the riders, and the government is going to be shut down indefinitely, right? So, so something is going to, at some point, there's going to be a deal, and the government's going to run, and it's not going to be with all 61 billion and the riders, and that means that a lot of Tea Party people are going to be upset, right? So, at some point, Boehner's going to take some flack. Um, and so, you know, maybe he could tell himself, well, I'm going to take flack anyway. Nothing but the absolute maximalist position is going to satisfy my base or, the, you know, the base of my caucus. Um, and so I might as well just avert, you know, avert what I think would be a political disaster for the party generally, which is the shutdown, and make the deal and take my lumps. Um, I don't think he's going to do that. I mean, I, I kind of get the sense that you do that. He and my colleague John Shade made this point too that maybe you you, you know all um, all flack is not equal for Boehner. You know, maybe it does to, you know just um, diffuse things a bit if he has a brief shutdown and can say, look, we tried, we towed the line, um, we took it as far as we could take it, we fought the good fight, and now we have to make a deal. Um, you know, maybe that's better. He'll still have some defections and a lot of upset um, people in his caucus, but. Um, but it's better than, than kind of caving from their perspective at the outset without, without even, you know, firing a shot. I'm sure it makes 
14 metaphors. But, um, <laughs> but you, you, so, you get, so you get the idea. I don't know. Um, uh, my sense is that Vayner does think he has to um, at least at least make a showing. You know, he can't he can't fold right from the beginning. Um, though it's ironic because, as you say, I mean, the terms of the debate have so far shifted um, in the GOP's direction. It is shocking to me that um, he wouldn't get more credit for that in any kind of you know, in any just world, he would, yeah. I guess. Um, um, the, your, your point about the White House, um, I think this is the, and just kind of um, going on the offensive about this stuff, to me, personally, and, and I think to a lot of people on the left and Democrats, it, it's the single most mystifying slash frustrating thing about the White House um, is just um, uh, a, a, in a you know, not inability. They certainly are able, uh, and they're very good when they decide to. But um, a, 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 an unwillingness um, to sort of play hardball um, at times, uh, and to kind of be the mature grown-up that's that's going for a deal when the other side appears to be playing, you know, hardball. Um, and I think there are, there are a lot of um, opportunities, as you say. Um, and I think. Um, uh, you know, I think a Rahm Emanuel type, certainly he, he was very good at doing this in the 90s, and I think his impulse, say, you know, during the health care debate was, was that. And so you had a bit of a tension. I thought, you know, maybe a healthy tension in the first two years of the Obama administration with a, with a Rahm type kind of arguing at times for a more scorched earth approach, and Obama himself and some of, some of Obama's other aides thinking you have to be sort of the grown up and bipartisan. And I think now maybe with, um, with Daly replacing Rahm, um, I think maybe we're too skewed in the other, you know, the conciliatory impulse. We're too, we're too um, stacked up on, on personnel who, who have the conciliatory impulse. Um, so, um, so I do agree with you. I think it's a source of frustration for people on the left. Um, I think, it, you know, it dates back. It dates back for a while. I mean, it dates back to health care. Even the stimulus people would argue, you know, that um, they could have been more aggressive. But, but I think the big, the big thing that is, is kind of standing out in the minds of people on the left is the Bush tax cut, where a lot of people thought they should just fight this, um, they, that they had more leverage than they, than they realized that they had. Um, they should just threaten to let all the tax cuts expire and, and accuse the GOP of wanting to just, you know, um, just raise everybody's taxes in order to protect um, tax cuts for millionaires. Um, you know, Obama had one moment in um, in 2009 uh, in September. I guess I think it was he did this speech in Cleveland where he, he used the the line "I'm holding hostage," you know, middle class tax cuts um, uh, for uh, for rich people's tax cuts, basically. And and you know, Boehner had his famous kind of uh, sort of temporary crumple uh, um, where it looked like he was going to cave. And, and so I think the left, people on the left side of that and thought, wow, you know, if it was that easy, why don't we play hardball all the time? And yet, instead, Obama, you know, they, they didn't do that. They kind of shelved the Bush tax cut debate until after the election. And, um, you know, probably got a good deal, but I think people on the left thought uh, on too, at too high a cost, they could have probably gotten a similar deal um, without the concessions on the estate tax. Um, anyway, suffice it to say, there is a long lingering suspicion of, of the Obama White House, um, which I think is unfair in some spots, but, but on target um, in other spots, um, that they are too quick to be conciliatory, too quick to compromise. And even even if you're gonna compromise, don't start there. You know, start with a hard line opening position and then compromise behind closed doors. So I, I do think this um, you have to understand this from the perspective of the left against this broader narrative um, of frustration that's sort of been building. Uh, you know, about why they can't just take a more scorched earth approach when that's um, that's the way the GOP plays it often to a very good effect. Yeah, well, and and you can Bill Clinton proved you can do both. Yeah. Um, I mean, ultimately he sat down with Gingrich and Army and actually you know did cut some deals, but the whole time you're softening them up, yep. you know, by attacking their, yep. their discretionary cuts and especially, of course, their in, entitlement cuts. And um, it's just, just shocked, shocks me that that piece has been missing so far. And my, my big takeaway on the, this CR uh, debate is just it's not that important. I mean, yeah. uh, another thirty billion in discretionary spending is just—it's just not future. Uh, doesn't make a big difference for the future of the country. And even these writers, I think, I assume, a lot of uh, conservatives, unfortunately, out in the country, are a little bit misinformed about yeah. them. They hear about defunding NPR and Planned right. Parenthood and defunding Obamacare, and they assume that forever more of these things will, will right. be uh, cut off from federal funding. Right. It's just a temporary measure for six months, almost. Uh, uh, 
uh, just symbolism. So right. it just doesn't it, it it doesn't seem to me worth the risk of a shutdown. You don't know which way it's going to bounce. It's probably going to bounce against Republicans just because you know people instinctively want to believe Democrats are soft on events. They instinctively want to believe you know Republicans are pro corporate, and they're just instinctively going to believe when uh, Democrats and uh, some folks in the media make the charge that Republicans have forced this and welcomed it. They're going to believe it, and there actually may be some Republicans out there saying yes, we welcome this. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's right. I mean, the other thing to me is the media template. You know, the second the government shuts down, what does every media organization in America do? They cue the footage of 95, right? right? Which everybody right. knows. Uh, you know, I mean, I say that sort of in quotes, right? But everybody knows played badly for Republicans and for Gingrich. So if, it, if everybody knows it, and that's the CW, and then, you know, regardless of where, where the country is now, you know, even if public opinion, I, I would dispute this, but even, you know, you could argue that public opinion is more uh, more receptive to cuts now, but if you have, you know, the first several days of coverage just queuing the footage from 95 where this place so disastrously for the Republicans and why are they driving the bus off the cliff again? I mean, that can't but shape, you know, public perceptions of how this is going to play this time. Yeah, and my, my um, uh, belief is that the, the debate over the debt limit uh, is, is much more consequential and I have much more leverage in that because people are so instinctively against raising the debt limit I think it, it makes pairing it with some sort of serious spending restraint sound uh, quite reasonable mm -hmm. and Republicans could could get some serious spending restraint there which I think politically is very important for a couple of reasons one of which you know if it was just to tossing out random ideas you know if you had a total budget freeze for five years in there or something like that then Senate Democrats have to meet that number as well, and it just limits their ability to uh, to demagogue Republicans. Um, and you know, the other highly consequential thing we we obviously have coming out next week or so is this Paul Ryan budget, which is also a much more important fight than than uh, discretionary spending in the rest of this fiscal year. Right, right, right. It's such a, I mean, you mentioned kind of. Um, a certain, you know, miscomprehension among conservatives in the country. I mean, it's a, it's a question worth exploring a bit more. I mean, how much do you think that kind of the average Tea party -er or, you know, sort of energized conservative voter understands that, um, you know, the money just isn't in, I mean, A, the money isn't in discretionary spending. B, there is a little over 10 years, but there's certainly not much this year or next year, right? <laughs> like, if you take any one right. year, a couple tens of billions of dollars in discretionary spending, just it's just, you know, it's not very meaningful one way or the other. Um, and yet, there's this fetishization of these figures. Um, I mean, do you think the average sort of Tea Partier sort of uh, understands just the, the kind of broad contours of the budget and where the, where the money is and where the action is? I'm not sure whether anyone in the public yeah. uh, understands it or very, yeah, but, very but, few but people. But the, the rest do. of the public isn't that ex as exercised about it, right? I mean, the Tea Partiers, it's like they're raison d'etre, supposedly. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it, it depends. I mean, a lot of these people are very, uh, very, very plugged in. But, you know, one of the interesting things that's gone on uh, since we've had this new Congress is, and this, we've written about this, others have written about this, is these Paul Ryan education right. sessions for the freshman um, Republicans who basically ran on uh, implicitly on the, the misconception you're talking about where they said, you know, we really have to balance the budget and um, suggested more or less we're going to do it, waste, fraud, and abuse, right. ending the bailouts, cutting right. the, the stimulus. And um, when they're asked about the Ryan plan, would mumble and look at their shoes right. and right. deny wanting to do anything with entitlements and actually would attack Obamacare for cutting Medicare. Right. And then you right. have them show up in Washington and you have Ryan say, uh, actually, look, guys, right. let me show you this chart, right. <laughs> this pie chart. Right. And if you're really serious about uh, dealing with the budget, you're going to have to deal with entitlements. And that's part of the reason that the Ryan budget is going to deal with entitlements and, and what is uh, will, will be an, an extraordinary act of political courage, uh, yes. I, I believe, on the part of other House Republicans. We'll, we'll see where it goes. Uh, I agree. Uh, I'm, I'll believe it when I see it, too. I'm st I still think we're going to get some uh, some amount of that looking down at your shoes thing. But you, Ryan, give him credit. He's forced the issue. I mean, I think, uh, I think his numbers are a little, die you know, I mean, he, you know, the, 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 the savings that he... Um, anticipates getting over, you know, 75 years or whatever seem 
um, you know, slightly dodgy to me, um, particularly for someone who thinks that the uh, anticipated savings in, in the um, Affordable Care Act won't materialize over the next 10 years. Um, uh, you know, the idea that the Congress is going to enact these cuts, much larger cuts over a period of 75 years, seems dubious to me. But I, I do give him credit for uh, putting a target on himself and saying, look, I'm the guy who at least will tell you where the, the, the action is, where the spending is. Uh, and and we'll, we'll, we'll be honest about the fact that we have to do something about it. So I, I do give him credit for that. Um, <clears throat> what, what there is. It'll be an extraordinary thing if they um, come out of this okay in my mind, and I hope they do. But you just look. It depends on how you ask ask the question. All points a little bit different, but um, you know, people oppose cutting Medicare by two to one. Yeah. Um, and y your colleague Bill Galston, I know you've been in book writing mode, so have, maybe you haven't been able to read every single piece on the. TNR.com, but had a... I read uh, everything on TNR.com. No. Okay. <laughs> Just for the record, let that be known. That's right, exactly. Yeah, he, as, so as you know, we right. had a piece the other day actually Wouldn't arguing that that President Obama should, um, uh, instead of taking kind of the obvious Clinton route and savaging Paul Ryan and Republicans over this, should actually say, oh, these, these are very interesting ideas and the basis for a serious discussion, and then try to meet them halfway. And Golson's argument is you can have it, uh, two big issues in the election, one the economy, the other debt. The economy, probably in best of circumstances, is not going to be that great. So you want to um, uh, limit your vulnerability on the debt, and you do that by um, um, by undertaking or attempting some serious bipartisan compromise on entitlements. Yeah, I'm not really moved by that, <laughs> but but uh, it has a logic, just not one that I subscribe to. Um, uh, look, the, the the one thing I will say is if you um, if you want to go kind of scorched earth on this stuff like Clinton did in '96 with the you know the, the Medicare Medicaid attacks, um, which were very effective, I think, um, and really wrapped that stuff around around Dole's neck and Gingrich um, by uh, by association. Um, you, you do have to have a certain kind of bloodlust, right? You, you have to be pretty ruthless. And so if, um, you know, getting back to the previous point, if, you know, your instinct um, and your, your just your comfort zone is to not be as aggressive as you need to be on that, then maybe you need to think of an alternative strategy, and that would be one. But I think the high percentage move would be uh, would be not that. <laughs> it would be, um, you know, hope that uh, we get this uh, acceleration, or at least the, the last three months of job growth continues basically linearly through, uh, you know, next summer or fall, and, um, and then, uh, you know, cut, you know, put yourself forward as the protector of, of um, you know, the, the benefits that people uh, have come to love and, or at least rely on. Um, it, it, it just, um, I, I never understood how, like, um, you know, I mean, uh, how just kind of limiting, you know, uh, by that calculus, it's like, you know, you don't have a great economy, so that's a negative, and then you limit your losses on this other issue that's bad for you. So, so like, what's the positive, right? <laughs> like, where do your mm -hmm. votes come from? I see where you hold down losses among certain people, but where do the actual votes come from? Um, so that, um, it just seems uh, seems tricky for me to imagine. That so, that so, so, so let's, let's say he, he takes... Um, he, he takes up your preference on, on this stuff politically, and it works. He, get, he gets reelected. Then, then what? What's the play fiscally? How, how do you deal with this problem, if at all, or do you consider it not a problem? Uh, I do consider it a problem. Um, I am not convinced that there is a um, solution um, before some kind of crisis moment um, because I don't really. See, I mean, look. Part of this, I just again, we may have different views on this just because of where we sit. But um, I just think things have to happen on the right before a conversation is even really possible. And some of those things are kind of sort of starting to happen, uh, like with this um, Tom Coburn, Grover Norquist back and forth over whether you know even something as seemingly reasonable as eliminating tax expenditures, you know, wasteful tax expenditures, which you would think in principle conservatives would be in favor of, is okay, or you should just be completely, you know, jihadi on tax increases, and even eliminating a wasteful tax expenditure isn't a good idea. Um, so, um, so I think in order for us to get to the point where we can kind of have a grand bargain on stuff, 
Um, uh, I think stu- you know, I think there needs to be movement on the right, um, and then we can talk about. Um, you know, then we can we can talk about what we do with Medicare and to far less recent Social Security. But I just think it's re- it's not we're not in a place yet where we're where it's worth having a conversation just because the constraints on people on the right, even if they wanted to engage and, and broker compromise, are so powerful that it would be pointless and you would have to go so far in that direction um, to even start the conversation that it wouldn't be worth having. Now, now I think you can make a very fair point, which is. Um, Certainly not going to advance that cause by wrapping this stuff around their neck in the 2012 election. You're, you know, if you're if, if you're trying to under, you know uh, figure out how to make the, the ground a little more fertile, um, that won't do it. But I think we're so far from fertile ground that it seems like a pretty marginal cost at this point. Yeah. Well, m- my hope is um, Ryan presents this budget, and um, there, I think he'll be able to ably defend it. And the question is you know, whether his caucus will be able to ably defend it, all, all the people who aren't as well informed uh, on this stuff as he is, which means just about everyone. Yeah. But um, just not um, present it and not get run over, live to tell the tale, and have a presidential candidate take it up, win um, in 2012, and then you, my theory is you can have a, uh, an era of conservative reform in 12 and 13. As um, you know, as as um, bold uh, as the uh, and shameless, you might say, <laughs> as the as the the uh, the Democrats just had in nine and and ten. So for me, er- everything is a prelude to 2012, and kind of e- everything um, depends on that, and um, everything that helps in making that case in advance of the 2012 election is good. Everything that hurts is bad. Well, since you raised 2012, maybe now would be the time to, to, to segue into that. What's, so, um, you know, m- when my colleagues and I talk about the field on the, in the GOP side, um, it, there was a little of this in 2008, but I think it's even more pronounced now. We sort of go through all the six or eight or ten candidates, and basically we you you do the candidate by candidate analysis, and you conclude that no one can win, um, which is yeah. a mathematical <laughs> impossibility because someone clearly is going to win. Um, but it, it's it's amazing, you know. Everyone seems to have these just um, mortal flaws, um, and. Um, so then you have to kind of go through again and say, well, whose is like the least mortal, right? Um, yeah. Uh, and you know, I, I have an idea about where that gets you, but I'm curious, uh, curious where you does that does that get you to Tim Pawlenty? I think it does. Yeah. I mean, I read Ramesh's um, Ramesh Panuru's piece, which I found you know mostly compelling, and my colleague John Chait has been arguing this this too. I do. I guess I do think that Palenti is the least flawed candidate, though he has, you know, fairly large flaws. Um, but I, I think I think that is where it where it gets you. Uh, do you do you disagree? Um, well, a, a couple things. One, I, I do. I totally agree about the same feeling as as um, 2008. And the one thing to, to remember about that experience is John McCain had no plausible path to the nomination. Right. He had an implausible yeah. path to the nomination. He still got there. Yeah. And I think that that should be some comfort for uh, for Mitt Romney. Right. Um, but what Romney has to worry about is he's, you know, he's not a, if he's the front runner, um, he's certainly not a, a giant killer, uh, even at this stage. And no one started running ads against him right. on health care. Right. So, you know, there's a big vulnerability there. But... You know, is it more of a vulnerability than McCain had on immigration, which literally destroyed his campaign for some period? It's yeah. just that he rose, yeah. he rose from the dead. Uh, Plenty um, was a very um, impressive guy. Um, I think he's the least offensive to all aspects of the party. But it, obviously, the question is whether you can um, excite people. And I think on on paper, the you know, the guy who has the least flaws. You know, working your way down to that guy works, but does it actually work on caucus yeah. night? You yeah. know, and does it actually work in terms of motivating people and getting them out there to vote for you? And that remains to be seen. And one hesitation I, I have with um, Plenty over the last several months is just he—he uh, he sounds so tinny yeah. when he's doing the pitchfork Plenty uh, thing. You know, playing to these audiences in a way that's somewhat insulting. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, it's, he's not been good. Um, uh, so far, trying to trying to kind of calibrate the message. Yeah. And then Newt, I mean, he, he just um, 
is flawed as, as a vehicle for the personal reasons we've heard a lot about. And then just temperamentally, although it, I, I, I had so much respect for him because he is um, the, a, a brilliant guy. Um, he, he's, you know, he's, he'd be brilliant you know, as a conservative intellectual. As a politician, you know, he's an Einstein among politicians. I mean, he's just an extraordinary guy, but he's, um, he, he, he just uh, is not uh, the steadiest or most solid character, and we saw it with the, the Libya thing. Yeah. Which to, you know, to have someone do that in the middle of a, a general election campaign would be just be an utter nightmare. Right. And unfortunately, Newt gives the sense he's all too capable of that, and I, I don't know how he can overcome that. But the, the upside of Newt, though, at the same time, though, he's he's been around forever. He's a former Speaker of the House. He should be the most establishment figure you right. can imagine, yet he still feels very boyish and still feels yeah. anti-establishmentarian, which is a key thing, yeah. um, you know, in, in this political environment on the right. And then, you know, someone, someone inevitably is going to, um, I'm leaving aside Daniels, I assume he's not going to run Haley. I still wouldn't be shocked if he, he pulls up short, although yeah. he's, he's obviously been very seriously doing the things he needs to prepare yeah. to run. But then we'll have someone, you know, from the bucket that everyone discounts or no one's thinking about, you know, uh, a la Huckabee last time, right. who emerges and, and becomes a various, very serious figure so, in the so race so unexpectedly. Who are the candidates for that? I, I, I always, uh, you know, the, uh, these conversations invariably sort of lead there, and you know the, that universe better than I do. Who are the kind of the people who are kind of toiling away at the given Editorial level or whatever, and have interesting ideas and um, you know some charisma that could plausibly step in um, to a vacuum on the GOP side. Well, I, you know, I'm not sure whether any of the people we think about are going to do it. I mean, the most obvious is Chris Christie. Right. Um, we, we had him in here uh, about a month ago, and uh, he, he was just very honest, saying he doesn't feel that he's ready and feels he's still growing every day. Uh, no pun intended, as as governor, and has never felt over his head as governor, and wouldn't want to step step into a situation where he does feel over his head. So I would give that you know like a one percent chance. Yeah. I'm thinking more you know the, the people who um, ha have some interest that everyone discounts that uh, suddenly the night after Iowa might look much more serious. Right. You know, um, that's exactly what happened with Huckabee. So you have Michelle Bachman who's going to be very strong in Iowa if she runs, who knows, you know, a Rick Santorum, a Rand Paul, you know, which I, I um, discount because he's been in the you know Senate all, all right. three weeks. All right. But um, if, if you're um, ambitious and shrewd right. and you kind of pick up a, a part of the party that's not really represented by anyone else, right. you know, this kind of, um, this, this libertarian tendency that extends to, to uh, yeah. overseas interventions. Um, but, the, right. but the GOP elders, you know, such as they are, are never going to let Michelle Bachman or Rand Paul be the nominee. Come on. Uh, this, this strikes me as wildly implied. You know, I mean, I think no, they could, I, I think I think they could very... scramble the field, certainly, but, but the idea of Michelle Bachman uh, as, you know, as the guy that, uh, you know, uh, pick your pick your you know Ron Kaufman is raising money for or something in in the summer of 2012. <laughs> right. It just seems uh, absurdly implausible to me. No, I, I would not think she'll win the nomination, but you know, she she could win Iowa. The point is, there always there's always some dark horse who emerges, and uh, that that's the case in almost any field, but it's especially the case I would think this year where you. Um, the, the, the uh, establishment candidates look very weak, and it's a volatile political environment generally, and when you have this very strong grassroots movement that doesn't want to play by the, the, the usual rules in the form of the, the Tea Party. So th that's ju I just throw that out. That's my big hesitation about yeah. handicapping yeah. Yeah. the field. It's kind of the big black swan. So, so two, two thoughts here. One, on Plenty, I completely agree with you. I think he's been bad so far, he, and, and you do have to worry about people who sort of look good on paper. But, um, you know, I mean, just a kind of small example of this, I think, last time around was, you know, Brownback was a guy who wasn't going to win the nomination, but looked like he could do really well in Iowa, right? I mean, in neighboring state and 
had the appeal to social conservatives, but he just, he sort of, he was flat and went nowhere and it just fizzled out. So I, I completely agree with you about that. I mean, I do think, you know, notwithstanding the fact that the neighboring state thing didn't really help Brownback, I do think Paul Lenti will benefit somewhat from that. Um, I do think also that he actually, and Ramesh says this in the, in the piece, I've sort of seen him up close a little too, I think he actually is pretty good kind of retail. Um, you know, he's good with people. He's got a kind of natural charm about him, an easy way about him with people, much more so than Romney, who's like the opposite, right? Yeah. And I think, um, so I think just, you know, the combination of the two, be, by by being um, very close means he can spend a time, I mean, he just basically live in Iowa um, for the next, you know, for the next, whatever it is, nine months, eight months, and, um, uh, I guess nine months, and, um, and, 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 and just kind of let that natural ease and natural charm uh, work and work to his advantage, and, and do a lot of these small venues, and you know, build up a, an organization sort of organically, um, which you know uh, could could really pay dividends on caucus night. So I, I think um, I think he would not have a chance if not for some favorable confluence of geography with his own strengths. And then I think you know, I mean, God, if 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 Pawlenty were to win Iowa. Um, you know, man, I, I can't imagine, you know, everyone sort of assumes that um, New Hampshire would be the sort of bulwark for Romney, but I got to think there are a lot of, you know, conservatives and Tea Parties in New Hampshire who aren't in love with, you know, Romney slash Obamacare, who if someone caught fire in Iowa would defect fairly quickly. Um, so then I think, you know, the pieces kind of start to fall uh, into place. But, it, uh, you know, it's a huge if there, and, you know, as you say, these things can seem to work on paper, and, and just, you know, you just never get any traction. I agree with you that, that polenti has been bad. Uh, he was really bad at that Iowa forum. Even, I thought, just his physical appearance, uh, he looked like that, um, that Martin Short character, Ed Grimley, or what, he, just the way he sort of, um, he, he kind of, it felt like the suit was too small for him or something, and his hair was, like, yeah, mashed down. It just was not, like, uh, a larger than life. You know, he was smaller than life, not larger than life. I thought he just he just looked physically very bad. Um, but one other question for you. So I, I have this sort of pet conspiracy theory, which is um, there is no universe to me in which Haley Barber is a plausible presidential candidate. I mean, just nothing. There's nothing you can say that will convince me that this guy is a plausible candidate from his physical appearance to his, his, his draw to his, you know, kind of checkered racial past um, to his lobbying career. Um, there's just, you know, to his just, you know, being a, just a consummate GOP insider, even the, the lobbying stuff aside. There's nothing, you know, I think that this guy has going for him uh, other than the fact that a lot of people owe him uh, from over the years and so they don't want to disabuse him of this fact. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, so sure, we'll cut you the check, Haley, whatever. You know, it's more like insurance, you know, than anything else. Um, so, so my pet theory is this, and, it, and I got to think about it when uh, so so the, the theory so that's one one kind of premise the other is well sh if I can do that math surely like smart GOP operatives can do that math right um, and so the question is then why are they going to work for him right like he just picked yeah he he's had, had a couple of impressive hires and he picked up that woman the, the top political aide to Jeb in Florida, which struck me as very mystifying uh, and so when I put those things together I come up with a, a conspiracy theory which is. Jeb wants Haley to be the nominee in 2012 to assure a uh, GOP loss, which then allows Jeb to run uh, in an open in an open election uh, in 2016. Um, I know you're going to say this is crazy. It's just it's just you know sweaty. You're, you're getting night. your Donald. You're getting your Donald Trump on. Exactly. But, but really, I mean, is that is that is that less plausible than Haley Barber as the GOP nominee? I don't think it is actually. Please tell well, me where I'm wrong, as, as Tony Riley would say. I think there are two things you probably, given where you are, under underappreciate about Haley Barber. One, people really like him, really, really like him. You know, it, he's he's such a character and a warm personality, and he lights up a room. It's just people enjoy the guy. And two, they're just anyone who's worked with him on uh, practical politics is just hugely impressed with him because he's a hugely talented guy. So <clears throat> I, I think th those things um, are, are much more likely factors here than, than uh, the theory. I, I agree, you know, as a vessel, in a, in a lot of ways, he's deeply flawed. And I was struck by um, his interview with uh, Chris Wallace on Fox News Sunday a month or so ago, which just was a terrible 
interview. Just a terrible performance by Haley. And you could just see that it, if he were advising someone else on you know how to go on a Sunday show like this and tout his candidacy, you know, he'd give them genius advice. Right. But the problem is, when, with trying to come up with that advice for himself, given his inherent flaws, it's just and really difficult. I mean, yeah. he comes up with the line, okay, yeah, I was a lobbyist, but what's the President of the United States Terrible. if not Terrible. the most powerful lobbyist right. in the world? You know, so it's Terrible. like from Haley Barbara Griffin right. to President of the United States is a natural step. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so I think he, I haven't seen him. Or right? Yeah, exactly. So I haven't seen him use that uh, yeah. lately. But um, I think Haley is pretty clear eyed, and I, I think he's aware of um, some of the problems you, you mentioned, and that's why it wouldn't surprise me that, that he doesn't. Uh, if he doesn't get in um, at the end. But on the other hand, you know, we just talked about how weak the field is. So if you're a, an ambitious guy of a, a certain age and this is your shot at it, you know, why not? And as far as Jeb goes, I, I just think he, um, if he wants to be president of the United States, he has to run this time. Yeah. And he's not going to do it. And 2016, um, may, maybe Obama will be reelected. Yeah, he, he'll been having been governor, you know, in eight, ten years, whatever it is, and then you'll have this crop yeah. of new Republicans from right. this time around, Mark all of whom, Rubio yeah, for, for all of whom it's too early now, except for maybe Rand Paul, um, you know, ready to go. So um, I, I think Jeb may be just missing his opportunity. Yeah. But we should, but before we finish here, I know you want to want to uh, engage in the cruel and heartless attacks against yes. my beloved New York Yankees. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't have the most sophisticated argument against the Yankees. The argument uh, basically boils boils down to one point, which is that the Yankees are evil. Um, so, um, <laughs> so I know it's it's there have been more sophisticated arguments made. So I guess I could elaborate on it just a little bit, which is. Um, look, I understand that there are a lot of teams, a lot of Major League Baseball teams, who basically, um, you know, uh, can just buy, you know, we basically have a two-tiered, you know, system, right, where the Minnesotas and the Milwaukee's and the Kansas City's, um, you know, serve as the sort of minor league teams to, you know, they produce talent and then the Yankees of the league buy them up and pay top dollar and whisk them away from their middle market franchises. Um, and so I understand that the Yankees aren't the only ones who do that. Obviously, Boston does it. If you look at the Phillies, I mean, it, their staff is preposterous, right? It's, it's ridiculous to have those four pitchers, um, only one of whom came up through the, the Phillies farm system. Um, so I, I understand that it's a critique that could be applied much more broadly. My problem with the Yankees, I guess, is that it, it, it's it's both um, Yankees management and Yankees fans, um, and and really it kind of it, it kind of leaches into just other people's perceptions of, of baseball and other fans' perception of what's going on is is this sort of assumption that basically um, you know the Yankees uh, are it's the, the sort of default assumption that the Yankees will the, the best most talented. Um, free agent who's likely to command the highest price, that person, the default assumption is that they're going to the Yankees the following year. And, and Cliff Lee was, was kind of that person in this offseason. Obviously, he didn't end up going there. Um, but again, it's, it's the sort of ethos, this, this idea, this sense of sort of entitlement um, that it would, you know, that is just where you go um, if you're the sort of A-Rod or the Cliff Lee of a free agent class. And it's that kind of sensibility that I find evil, basically. <laughs> You're kind of George W. Bushian on this. That's right. I mean, again, you know, Boston may, you know, ends up with these guys sometimes, but, you know, if you talk to Boston fans, they have this kind of complex, you know, well, you know, we never kind of do do as well with this stuff, and we'll be lucky if we pry one away, And but whereas the Yankee fans are just like, yeah, that person's going to be a Yankee next year. Well, that, that, that's just how it is. What's, you know? what's, what's Boston's payroll this year, by the way? No, I, I, I don't know. I suspect it's as large or larger. I mean, they certainly made, you know, Adrian Gonzalez and Carr Crawford, I mean, they they, they did more, they were more active in the offseason than the Yankees, certainly. So, uh, again, it's not, I'm not arguing facts here with you on some level. I'm arguing, <laughs> well, I'm I'll, arguing I'll, I'll give you, uh, you know, sensibility, you know. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll respond here. <clears throat> well, first of all, I think um, there, there's obviously a lot to what you say, and I think the Yankees are much less likable uh, than they used to be. And for, for me, well, I grew up a Yankees fan because my dad's from New York, even, even though I was raised in Washington. There's was just no other alternative. I was right. you know, weaned on the Yankees. My most prized possession as a kid was a Yankees hat he brought back from New York. And, and, I, and I, I do make an exception for people who are sort of born into the creed. So I, I, yeah, you know, so I don't consider you completely evil. So but uh, the, the teams, and I, I really don't 
see how once someone gets beyond their irrational hatreds and animus, how someone could not uh, admire and even like the Yankee teams of the mid 1990s. You know, because it was um, the balance of the team uh, was uh, raised, you know, from the farm system, the core of the team, Jorge Posada, uh, Derek Jeter, Rivera, Andy Pettit, Bernie Williams, you know, that, that's kind of the spine of the team right right down the, the, yeah. the middle yeah. of the field. And those are home homegrown guys. They're classy, Paul O'Neill, not homegrown, but, you know, they got right. him in, in a trade. And it's just a hard-nosed, gritty player. And that was kind of the character of that team. And f right. for me, uh, the, the end of those Yankees, more or less, even though, um, obviously, uh, a number of those guys are still around, was when they signed um, Jason Giambi, mm -hmm. who was a classic kind of acquisition that you're yep. complaining about. You know, and, and this guy who uh, had no character uh, whatsoever, at least, you know, kind of baseball character in the same way, you know, abusing steroids and was just sort of, you know, flown in from Oakland. Right. So, and, and I think. The team now has has more of that yeah. cast than, than I would like. Most obvious obvious examples, you know, Teixeira, A Rod, right. and CC Sabathia. But there's still you know some homegrown yeah. talent there. You know, Robinson Cano, um, Brett Gardner, Jeter, still Posada, still although he's going to uh, DH. But you know, I, I, I see what you're saying. I I I used to be an extreme Yankee defender and nah. just like you know, th this is this is capitalism, guys. They right. have a more effective franchise and a bigger market, and they invest in the team and just get over it. But um, the the NHL NFL model is becoming a little bit more um, attractive to me. I, I will say this though: you can you can in baseball you can buy. Basically, a playoff spot. Right. You know, if you spend uh, um, for the one of the top spenders in the league, yeah, you can you can usually assure yourself that. Right. But you cannot. I know from uh, hard experience here, you cannot buy yourself a championship. Uh, I think that's right. Yeah, and you know, and, and I, I just read it. I mean, the Mets show that you can't even buy a playoff spot at, at times. You know, so yeah, uh, not necessarily. So there is something to be said for you know managing the budget you have, you know, which they clearly, you know, did effectively. I mean, I do agree with you that they sort of jumped the shark at some point kind of in the late 90s, early, you know, maybe early 2000s. Um, and, uh, and you know, uh, particularly with, I just think with, the, you know, with the, some of the pitching acquisitions, you know, the um, Carl Pavano and Burnett, um, you yeah, know, these, these guys that were just, you know, these were like Mets-style acquisitions. They really were. Um, and I think at some point they just got less discriminate. You know, this ethos that I'm talking about almost came back to, to just kind of blew up in their face because they would they would kind of indiscriminately grab these guys who had had, you know, Vasquez last year was sort of like this, you know, who had, who had, had great yeah. years the year before without kind of figuring out and thinking through how they were going to fit into the organization and fit into the staff yeah. and, and what they, yeah, yeah. you know, how they play in Yankee Stadium and, and they didn't would just kind of snatch these guys up. So I think I do think they almost kind of got what they deserve by by just shifting too far in that in that direction. Well, and that's, and that's why they're, they're so terrible in the 80s as well. In the 70s teams were, were um, you know, more carefully crafted with uh, indigenous Yankees or, or right. smart trades, although there was a free agent here and there, you know, Reggie right. and Catfish Hunter and whatnot. Right, right, right. You know. Um, good. Well, they uh, they started off the season well from your perspective, right? So you. You're That's right. Uh, Six three victory right. against the Tigers. But, uh, good. Well, we will. We shall see. Um, we. Uh, well, I'm sure we'll be um, rooting in diametrically opposed directions all year. But. Uh, but that's, uh, yeah, that's I, I find just one last baseball yeah. thought. I, I sadly find myself a little less of a baseball fan uh -huh. than I than I used to. Well, I've gotten more into hockey, so you know that goes goes into June. So it just right. leaches in. Uh, there's only so much bandwidth I can spend on sports. But also, I just think baseball. You know, I don't relish going to baseball games uh -huh. anymore. They're so long. Yeah. And I, I have. A, a, a series of reforms that all my uh -huh. traditionalist friends, you know, hate. But I think there should be laser strike zones. Uh -huh. I think there should be instant replays. I think there should be a series of measures to crack down on any delay yeah. of the game to to um, speed it up. I mean, any game, no matter how beautiful and subtle it is, yeah. um, is no game is worth watching for three hours. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, I'm of two minds of this. I mean, I do like the sort of languorous, you know, summer afternoon. Um, there, there's something about just kind of the, 
the rhythm of it or whatever the baseball mystics, you know, whatever words they invoke, I agree with them, you know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, sort of scaled up over a 162-game season, it's too much. I, I agree with you. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's fine in late July when I have an afternoon to kill, but, it, you know, I can't really do it more than a couple times a year for precisely that reason. So I guess I do agree with you. Um, anyway, and I've actually tried to make myself into a hockey fan, not because of the length and my uh, my frustration with the game, but my frustration with not having a franchise to root for. I, I was born in New York, and my, I come from a family of anti-Yankees, so I rooted for the Mets as a kid, um, uh, but was, was so disgusted with that franchise and the terrible um, management, you know, general management, um, you know, the Bobby Bonilla, you know, the... Uh, Vince Coleman era uh, that um, that I just sort of disavowed my mess fandom and uh, you know have lived in DC for the last 10 11 years and tried to make myself into a local sports fan but have been frustrated at every turn basically well you got a great hockey that's my hockey I know well pass. exactly so I've been trying to make myself into a hockey fan with with mixed success um, but I, it, it looks more attractive every you know, with every passing year here so yeah, that may uh, be the way of the future if, if, if uh, any sports fan, I think, should at least enjoy playoff hockey. That's so right. Hopefully, yeah, that's, you'll have a good long batch of it here coming up. We're looking looking forward to, to yeah. taking a look. Great. All right. Well, very nice talking it. to you. Likewise. Good luck with the book. Thanks a lot. Okay. Talk Take to care. You.